Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast, where we seek progress, not perfection. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. I'm Brian Lenskis and my, my compadre Tro was tied up today so he couldn't make it. So I get Dr. Mason all to myself. Paul Mason, welcome so much. It's so great to have you. Uh, gosh, I'm just been blown away by everything you're talking about online with our friend Ivor Cummins and, and everything else you're doing, your, your YouTube video you just released. So tell everyone about what you're coming up with, with all COVID and metabolic health and all that kind of stuff. Well, Brian, it's great to see your smiling face. So uh, basically, I've just been looking at the risk factors. I mean, we all know that, you know, this is a highly contagious virus and, uh, you know, it's not always going to be possible to stop yourself from getting it. So uh, I guess the question is, how can we don a suit of armor? How can we make it less dangerous if we do get it? And when I dug into the research, it all came back to one thing, metabolic syndrome. And I mean, this is something that you guys, your, you, know, you and Tro and your listeners are all familiar with. And the funny thing is, we have a look at the risk factors which are cited, obesity, high blood pressure, these kind of ones. They all come back to a common cause. It comes back to insulin resistance. And I looked at the literature and it was like, there's a case to be made. So uh, as you saw, I thought this deserves a lecture. Yeah, and you did a great job of going through that. I think that's a surprise to a lot of people. People weren't making that connection. Even the, in the U.S. where we're seeing the most disease, uh, New Orleans, New York, we're looking at the population maybe not being as healthy in some of those areas. Some of the areas where people are very fit, we're not seeing it as much. And we thought it was just, you know, uh, population, you know, uh, density and things like that. But you, you've come up with a lot with the metabolic health. Yeah, well, that was interesting because we were waiting for the data. We we're getting the data coming out of China and they were saying old people are at risk and so on and so forth. And then we started seeing some of the Italian and Spanish data come through. But it was when the U.S. started came through that really solidified it. So there was a bunch of New Yorkers who were um, disproportionately young. And then uh, I've, I've sort of been following it fairly closely. And then we saw the New Orleans data, and which is obviously a population uh, which in some quarters has worse metabolic health on average than New York. And we started seeing figures that were um, correlating and associating well with the metabolic ill health. And whichever way you slice it or dice it, it, it seems that metabolic ill health is a major risk factor. And this makes sense also with the ageing. Because as we know, as people age, they tend to get less metabolically healthy. And I, my personal feeling is that somebody who's older and metabolically healthy is going to be better protected than somebody who's younger and quite ill. Yeah, and it's just waiting for all that data to come back. I think that's what we're seeing. And, and like you said, it's, a, it's an association. As we get older, we get more metabolic disease. So that's the, you're, you're saying it's the underlying metabolic disease that's a problem rather than the chronologic age. Well, for, for most intent, I mean, obviously, we're not going to live forever. But, uh, you know, if you're 80 years old and in, you know, prime health, and you might have another expected 20 years of life expectancy, you're probably going to be considered to be better health than somebody who's 50, but who's headed for, has already had a, you know, quadruple bypass and he's headed for an early grave in five years time. You know, you'd rather be the person with the 20 year expected lifespan who, while they're older, is going to be a heck of a lot healthier. And we have a look at this study there. They actually looked at the five features of metabolic syndrome. So there's basically five metrics that are used. We know they all relate to insulin resistance, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL levels, a, uh, the central adiposity, and uh, I think there's one more. I'm not sure which one I've dropped off. But basically, they all relate to insulin resistance. And they did a study on the American population only looking at adults, and they found that on average only 12% of US adults were healthy across all five metrics. And when you went to the oldest group, those over, you know, 60, 65 years old, it was only 2%. So clearly, you know, you've got a one in 50 chance, statistically speaking, if you're elderly, of being metabolically healthy in the US. That's not a good look. 
Yeah, that's pretty damning when you, when you look at it and you start realizing, oh, that because one of the things a lot of people are talking about is herd immunity. And when you say, well, your herd is sick, then you know, we're all at some increased risk, right? There's no really safe, you got 12% of the people who look like they're safe right now. I mean, that's kind of a, a scary thought, isn't it? Well, the problem is, I mean, if you're saying, well, let's get herd immunity, let's, uh, and probably, so the idea of herd immunity is pretty obvious. It just means that, you can, earn, you can only spread the virus if there's vulnerable people around you. And if people have already had it and they're immune, then there's less people that you can spread it to. So if what we call the R0 value, if people are spreading the virus to, on average, more than one person, then the number of people with that infection will escalate. If they're spreading it to, on average, less than one person, the numbers will decrease. And the idea of herd immunity might be that I've got five people around me, but if four of those are immune because they've already had it, then brilliant. Then they, you know, the, you know, hopefully I'll spread it to less than one on average and it will die out. But the problem is to get herd immunity, we have to have about 70% of people infected. And the question is, is there 70% of the population who could relatively be safely infected? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, there's certainly some healthier people who could you know with pretty good odds get infected and uh, likely not end up in hospital or in ICU but the trouble is there's enough sick people that you know if you were if you uh, pursue a strategy of herd immunity in a very unhealthy population um, so you could probably take different state populations in the US and the strategy of chasing herd immunity is likely to be much safer and much more effective in a younger, healthier population, whereas if you were to do that in somewhere like New Orleans, you might be asking for trouble. Yeah, absolutely true. And I think that there, we're going to see regional differences. We already do. And, and you know, one of the questions raised, and, and you may have an answer for this, is why California got largely spared. Obviously, we've had deaths, but not to the extent that they've had in New York. There are some people who believe, at, and I think I'm in that crowd for, for some part, is that we did have some early exposures in San Francisco, LA, San Diego, uh, because a lot of the, the people who might have been infected were visiting. So there were some people that were pretty darn sick that we saw back in December and January that we said, ah, it's a bug. It takes six or eight weeks to get better. You're going to be better. Uh, they were testing negative for the flu, but they had 104 fevers and all the symptoms that we're seeing of COVID. Uh, and, and it's possible that there are more than one strain going around where one more virulent strain is hitting the East Coast more so than the West Coast. I don't know what, what's your feeling on that, because I don't think we're much metabolically healthier necessarily in California than New York. I haven't followed the California situation well, but I would wonder whether there might even be other factors. I mean, obviously, population density of New York is pretty high, so that's going to increase the risk of rapid spread. But what about something like sunlight? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's absolutely a factor. And everybody talks about this vitamin D business. And I think that they might be getting off at the wrong bus stop with that one. And I wonder whether it could be something called nitric oxide. So when you get exposed to the sun, you get a, uh, your body produces vitamin D from cholesterol, which everybody knows. But most people don't realize the body actually generates from ultraviolet A radiation, it generates nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a, an insulin sensitizer. If we actually have a look at people across summer and winter on a population basis, we see their average blood sugar levels, and we can see this very reliable data in HbA1c actually drops in summer. And we've got very good mechanistic evidence of understanding how this nitric oxide, which is produced on exposure to the sun, is actually beneficial. And if we have a look at population data, um, sun exposure is actually very, very um, protective. I'll give you an example. So in one of the Scandinavian countries, they, did a, um, they, they looked at people who had skin cancer. And they actually found that for people who had non-melanomatous skin cancer, so your basal cell carcinoma and your squamous cell carcinomas, on average, across the, the, these large studies, they lived for 10 years longer. Now, that's not to suggest that the skin cancers make you live longer but it is to suggest that there may be something about the sun exposure, which is associated with those skin cancers that may be making you live longer. And everybody gets hung up on the vitamin D. Um, and certainly if we have a look at the data on giving people vitamin D, we know people who have the highest natural vitamin D levels, they do live longer. And when I say natural vitamin D, that's because they're getting it from the sun. 
But when we give them vitamin D as a supplement, the, there is some studies, especially using large doses that show um, benefit, but they're an, almost an order of magnitude lower than the benefit you get from naturally derived vitamin D levels. And that's suggesting that the vitamin D level is a surrogate marker or a correlational marker for nitric oxide production. And we've got, they've done some really nice studies where they put people under UVA lamps to boost the nitric oxide and you can get an immediate drop in their blood pressure. And they put people in front of infra, in this particular study, they were using infrared lamps as a control. And there was no drop, so it wasn't the heat, it wasn't the infrared, it wasn't this other thing, it was something specific to the ultraviolet A radiation that was giving it. So perhaps in the Californian population, they're getting outside a bit more, there's a bit more nitric oxide getting around. I'm not sure, but we certainly need to study this. And if we have a look at how we used to treat tuberculosis, I mean, I'd, you know, you know, there's a, basically this combination, rifampus and isoniazid, rubber, you know, ethambutol and so on and so forth, that you know, we have antibiotic cocktails that we use now to treat tuberculosis. Well, what did we used to do to treat tuberculosis before antibiotics? It was sun therapy. Yeah, they like, put them in sun therapy out in the middle of the desert here, yeah. Heliotherapy. So you've got pictures of literally acres and acres of open air schoolyards with children sitting out there schooling in their underwear. I mean, some of these, you go to some of the stuff in Switzerland, it's absolutely fantastic. And these were known to be so damn effective. They continued to be in operation even through the, the course of the world wars. Um, this is how we, the, the art, it is well known that it was used to treat respiratory tuberculosis and even um, um, bony tuberculosis, where it actually infects the insides of the bones. There's um, some old literature. Now, there, unfortunately, while this is considered um, ancient wisdom, and it's, it was clearly anecdotally effective enough um, for them to do that, you know, they did it for many years and they would actually have these kids literally being cured of TB as far as their testing parameters worked. We probably don't have the data done in terms of the randomised blinded control trials today where we can actually point down and calculate p-values and things like that. That would give us a, um, you know, a, a high degree of confidence. But I certainly think we can learn a lot from the history um, of this and I would probably say sunshine is one of those things especially if you're uh, in early or later in the day when you're not going to get sunburnt you know that's a very low risk thing to be doing yeah, and also when you bring up the nitric oxide exercise will, will stimulate nitric oxide also so that may be another you know uh, protective factor immune system wise well athletes have known about this for ages I mean you you go to YouTube I mean we've got some uh, Australian athletes at the pointy pointy end um, in our national championships and you can I won't name names or anything but you can go to YouTube clips and you can sort of see some of them sprinting around the track and you can see their their running bib jogging up and down and when it's on the downward thing you can see these little patches on their chest and this is totally allowed under uh, underwater I will say and they've got GTM patches on um, and athletes will actually also take something called beetroot juice because uh, Beetroot is the richest known source of nitrate. You know that thing that everybody's afraid of in bacon, nitrate? Well, it's actually more in celery and more in beetroot juice than it is in hot dogs and bacon. But um, so athletes will actually, there's these uh, commercial product called uh, of, of, of beetroot shops where you actually absorb all the nitrate. It, gets, uh, it goes into your saliva and then the bacteria in your mouth will actually, they're called nitrite converting, uh, producing bacteria, they'll convert some of that nitrate to nitrite. So you basically get this effect of nitric oxide. And as you said, it helps the blood vessels relax. It actually increases the, uh, the blood flow to the muscles and increases the efficiency of um, exercise. But uh, unfortunately, this is very hodgepodge. You could just take something, if you used a mouthwash and you just you know knock out all the bacteria in your mouth, then that, you know, basically stuffs up this conversion. So for my money, it's far better and far safer to uh, just expose yourself to sun safely. And I, I would actually add a word of caution though, because, um, and without risk of getting a bit too technical here, the, the two main types of ultraviolet radiation that will penetrate the atmosphere are UVA and UVB, and they've got different wavelengths. And the UVB, while it's the one that causes the uh, vitamin D, it is also shorter wavelengths to get absorbed and to cause DNA damage and to cause sunburn. 
Um, but because it's shorter wavelength, it gets filtered out by the atmosphere much more than UVA. So when the sun's lower in the sky, effectively, these sun rays have to pass through a greater mass of atmosphere before they hit you. So the proportion of UVB that's going to cause sunburn is very much less when you're casting a long shadow. And as a rough rule of thumb, I tell a lot of my patients, have a look at your shadow. If your shadow is at least as tall as you are, that's got what we call a favourable UVB index. And it means that you're probably going to be able to be out there for half an hour or more without actually getting sunburnt. But if you're casting a small shadow where it's overhead, then these UVB rays are able to penetrate. And sure, you'll get the vitamin D, but you're also going to get sunburnt. And these are the ones that are more strongly correlated with, uh, with the, uh, the skin cancers. And uh, some people might actually have a, you know, pass a casting eye over the literature and say, oh, but the UVA is the one that causes aging of the skin. Well, this is just a horrible misinterpretation of the science. So we know one of the effects of sun exposure is you get a tan, right? Yet the skin goes darker. So a lot of researchers, they needed a marker, an objective marker that they could actually say, well, is the skin being damaged or not? So they settled on skin pigmentation. And because UVA, because it penetrates the skin deeper because it's got these longer wavelengths, it actually can stimulate the, these melanocytes to produce melanin and actually stimulate skin pigmentation more. So it is actually the UVA that is more likely to give you a tan. You know how sometimes you get sunburned, peels off, and your skin's the same colour. Whereas sometimes you get exposed to the sun and you don't burn and you just end up with a tan. Well, it's actually the UVA that's actually more likely to be causing the tan. And a lot of these researchers have confused a tan with skin damage. Now, it's possible that if you also got us exposed to UVB at the same time and you had DNA damage and burn, and so, you know, that, that clearly is skin damage. But in isolation, UVA is, doesn't cause anywhere near as much DNA damage and you end up with a nice colour. Well, heck, is there a way to filter out more of the damaging uh, UVBs and keep the UVAs? Well, that's the time of day, the earlier, yeah, the longer the, the shadow you're casting. Well, the other thing is, it's actually very, uh, very weak. The UVB doesn't really penetrate through glass effectively. So it, it, it gets filtered out very easily. So, you know, uh, you know, if you're sitting in the car and having the sun come through the windscreen and landing on your hands, you probably don't need to be putting sunscreen on your hands, you know, because that's going to be, even if you can feel the warmth of the sun, you, you won't get burnt through that. Your, your arm that's hanging out of the open window then sure, that could get burnt, but not, not from the sun rays that are actually passing through glass. Well, heck, man, we're learning about suntans, exercise. What else do you got for us, Doc? Well, that was a bit of a tangent, wasn't it? <laughs> we well, do I mean, that on this show. That's perfect. That's how we do it. You know, that's how we roll. Well, let, let's come back to this whole metabolic um, association so of insulin resistance and the immune system. So we all know that sugar can damage the immune system. We have this thing called glycation where the sugar molecules will attach to a protein and basically defunction the protein. And we can have sugar that will attach to natural killer cells. We can have it attached to T cells. We can, all these essential components of the immune system that will help us fight an infection like a coronavirus. If we have sugar damage, they will uh, be defunctioned. But here's the thing about metabolic disease. It's on a spectrum. And long before your blood sugar levels go up through the roof, you'll have something called insulin resistance where your insulin's not working so well, so your body needs to make more insulin. So they did this really nice study in Nature. It was published last year where they got a bunch of people who were insulin resistant, but they had normal blood sugar levels. And then they compared them to a healthy population. They followed these guys for a long time and they would measure... I think it was something like 41 different parameters in their blood, different growth factors and different cytokines. And they followed them for long enough that these guys had a bunch of upper respiratory tract infections, a common cold. You know, they're basically a, a viral infection in their respiratory tract, which is how coronavirus gets you. And then they looked at growth factors that were particular to the immune response. So we know that there's certain things in the, uh, uh, in our, cell-to-cell -cell communication that are actually quite necessary for the immune system to function. So we have these things called interferons and they're signaling proteins 
and uh, if you're if you get your cells get infected by a virus, it has to send out these signals to try and you know rally the troops. We have uh, Th1 pathways which uh, generate responses against viruses. We have something called interleukin 12, which activates our natural killer cells, which is one of our first line defenses against viruses. We have, so we have, basically we have a lot of these growth factors. And what they actually found is that in the subjects who were insulin resistant, when they got a cold or a viral infection, these pathways were significantly inhibited. So much so that the authors actually concluded that basically the, state of insulin resistance is akin to an immune deficient state. And then the story gets even trickier, or a bit more interesting perhaps, because you may have heard about something called the cytokine storm, which is where we have uncontrolled inflammation and uncontrolled release of these cell to cell molecules called cytokines, they're they're signaling molecules. And these are associated with uh, inflammation to such an extent that it can be fatal. And this is how a lot of people with coronavirus are actually passing away. And when they actually uh, looked at this in this study, they actually looked at your your total cytokine response. And they found between days one and six, the overall cytokine response on viral infection between healthy people and insulin resistant people was pretty much identical. But then what happens after a few days? You're meant to get better from the virus, right? They found that, you know, in the second week between days seven to 14, the insulin resistant folks had a significantly higher cytokine response. And then even in what we call the convalescent or the recovery phase, you know, up to five weeks afterwards, these insulin resistant folks still had a significant cytokine response that was persistent. It was basically disappeared in the healthy folks. So we have this elevated cytokine response and this persistent cytokine response in insulin resistant individuals. And my personal feeling is that this just indicates an increased risk of cytokine storm. And given that this is how people, you know, they have this uh, thing, acute respiratory distress syndrome combined with a cytokine storm, that's how people die. You know, for me, I don't want to be insulin resistant. And people have to understand, you don't have to be diabetic to have this risk. As this Nature article showed, insulin resistance in and of itself is enough. Well, and that's the point. I think the point that we've been hammering here in the States is, Check your insulin level. As a matter of fact, I just had a guy, his, his sugars were totally normal. A1C is normal. Insulin level 58. And in our terms, like less than five is considered metabolically healthy. You think, uh-oh, that's a trouble. So this guy's at major metabolic uh, risk. So you start seeing that and you say, well, when they say these guys are young and healthy that died, they could be metabolically sick, but be looked thin on the outside. So they look thin and they look healthy. So they say they're healthy people without really knowing their insulin level, what their baseline cholesterol and all that was. Yeah, the Tophies, for sure. And, I mean, and this is the problem because you can be overweight and metabolically healthy and you can be skinny and metabolically unhealthy. So, so certainly if you are overweight, you're much more likely to be insulin resistant, but there's not a perfect one-to-one correlation there. And I think we see this in some people. If I actually do a DEXA scan, and I, I've chatted to you about this before, um, we can actually see when people lose that first 10 kilograms or 20 pounds of weight, the fat that disappears first is the fat in the abdomen, the fat around the liver, the visceral fat, which is the one that's associated with the insulin resistance. So given that you can actually lose a few kilograms pretty rapidly on a healthy diet and that the fat that you lose first is the most dangerous fat, then that's a pretty good reason to be saying, okay, it's not too late. I haven't had coronavirus yet. You know what? I'm just going to try and protect myself from the effects just in case I do get the infection. I want to try and be a bit more resilient to it. Let's lose some weight. Yeah, and especially that liver fat, that 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 really dangerous um, intra-abdominal fat. Um, you know, that that's really a key. And so some people get frustrated because they lose one pound. Or they say I only lost a pound, but if it's that fat around the liver, that makes a huge metabolic difference. Oh shit! Yeah, and I mean, here's the extent of it. So in females, we've actually done some um, scanning, and we're associating the amount of visceral fat with uh, insulin resistance metabolic syndrome, the chance for a female of having diabetes, if she's got one extra kilogram of visceral fat, is increased four times. One kilogram, four times. Uh, People don't realize how powerful, and I say powerful in a negative way, this visceral fat is. 
Yeah, and, and with the the inflammation that you're talking about, and you know this, it's interesting with the cytokines. Even though those sugars are normal, because we always think of the sugar as being the pro-inflammatory, but it's the high insulin with the insulin resistance, maybe. Yeah, well, I mean it, that is absolutely contributing, and that's what made this nature study so uh, so interesting because they took people deliberately with normal blood sugars on a glucose challenge. So, um, you know, the, the data's there for everybody to see. This is a very well done study. Yeah, it fits in with what we're seeing clinically now, exactly what we're seeing with COVID, it would make sense. And then the other point that you raised with Ivor, and I was intrigued by this discussion, was the, the LDL, the precipitous LDL drop with COVID infection. Yeah, so, I mean, that's obviously correlational. Um, but what we do see is we see that when people um, who are hospitalized with coronavirus are the ones who we can study and do blood tests on every day, we see a daily reduction in their total cholesterol, their HDL and their LDL cholesterol levels, and then followed by a gradual increase when they start to recover. Um, but the really interesting thing for me is the, uh, what looks like that high cholesterol levels appear to be associated with protection from viral infections. And we've got a bunch of very good stuff that goes up. Um, there's one study which I haven't actually uh, talked too much about yet in my, my lectures. It sort of dropped off. But it actually looked at uh, people's risk of uh, sepsis from um, uh, infection. And I can't find it just right now, but from memory, the cutoffs they use were uh, less than 70 and over 70 of LDL in your units, uh, the milligram units. Mm -hmm. And they showed the chance of sepsis and severe complications from uh, pneumonia type symptoms was increased by five times in patients with LDLs less than 70. And that's a, that's a huge risk. We've got data specifically on the elderly population saying that the chance of dying from an infectious cause is much, much higher if you have low cholesterol levels. And this, uh, this rule also applies for all facets of cholesterol. So we break it into you know, the three major components that people have heard of we call total cholesterol, um, which is basically a reflection of your HDL cholesterol and your LDL cholesterol added together. And it doesn't matter whichever way we, we break it up. Total cholesterol, HDL in isolation, LDL in isolation, higher levels appear to be protective from infection and this should put a lot of people at ease if they say well you know what happens if i go on a ketogenic or a low carb diet and i have more fat and my cholesterol level goes up and it's like well if it's your healthy cholesterol that's going up and we mean that cholesterol that's not damaged by sugar or damaged by oxidative stress if it's a healthy cholesterol rise you know your ldl can go up through your eyeballs i could care less it's probably conferring protection yeah, and that's an interesting point. And that's LDL pre-illness, right? That's not after they're sick looking at the LDL. That's, that's, pre, that's their baseline LDL. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, almost certainly, given that it's role in fighting infections, almost certainly, even if you were healthy, your LDL, we know. So cholesterol is what we call a negative acute phase reactant. So acute phase reactants are the term we give. So we know certain elements that we can test in the blood will go higher if somebody is inflamed or sick. So a negative acute phase reactant means that these elements will fall when you're sick. And we know that cholesterol is one of these. Cholesterol, and so this is not a unique finding. This finding that cholesterol drops with infection has been literally known for over 100 years. I've actually, I've found some papers from... Uh, 1919 talking about this so this is not a unique finding i mean this is this is, this is old school we know that cholesterol is involved in the immune response we know it falls when you get an infection and we know that the severity of fall is correlated very well with the severity of infection why do you suppose no one talks about that? You know, I, I had never heard that until about a year ago, maybe, uh, talking about LDL having a protective role in the immune system. Why do you think that is? Look, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I can understand why people don't talk about the drop with infection because that's just correlation and doesn't infer causation. But there's really no excuse not to talk about the data that shows the pre-infection levels are actually very protective, that the baseline levels are protective. So uh, there's really no excuse not to talk about that. 
But this is no, no different to what we see with saturated fats and the whole dogma and ideology. So, I mean, there's been over 10 systematic reviews done on uh, saturated fat and polyunsaturated fats now. And on balance, they all find in favour that high saturated fat intake leads to longer lifespan and leads to better health. And in the pool of evidence that we use to formulate these opinions, we've got three very large, long-term, properly done randomised controlled trials. And I think the reason that nobody talks about these is because the investigators deliberately obscured their findings. And so the Sydney Diet Heart Study, which was done in the 1970s, the original data that actually demonstrated worse outcomes in people on polyunsaturated oils was not published. So, uh, or it, it took uh, you know, a long time to be published. So if I can uh, just find them uh, quickly. So we've got three of them. So basically the Sydney Diet Heart Study was run between 66 and 1973, and they had guys who had already had a heart attack. And uh, the results weren't actually originally published. And they weren't published until 2013 after somebody had discovered and dragged them out of a basement. Like quite literally. Then we have the Minnesota study, which had over yeah, 9,000 thing, wow. 9, participants. When this Minnesota study was finished, it took 16 years to publish the results. So, and then the results weren't even completely published. There was some data that was still sort of left out. And when they asked the lead author of the study, who's now passed away, why they didn't publish at the time. In his own words, he says, well, the results were disappointing. You know, how do you interpret that? They didn't get what we wanted. And Ansel Keys, Ansel Keys, he was a co-investigator on this study. So did that have anything to do with it? You know, possibly. Yeah, it's um, amazing, isn't it? It's amazing, you know, how they buried the data. And, and I think it's the same study that showed that the margin was lowering the LDL, but people were having more events. That's exactly the one. Yeah. And again, those findings, they weren't published until 2016. So remember, this study started in 1968. The data collection, everything was done and dusted by 1973. They could have published in 1973. It was only published after some fantastic detective work. Um, and, it didn't, uh, and that was by a guy called Christopher Ramsden. He was the same guy who actually published the Sydney Diet Heart Study in 2013 as well. So without him, this proof would have been hidden forever from the scientific discourse. And even in our modern era, we're not, we're not blocked from this. The, the Women's Health Initiative study, 700 million US dollars, it actually found that replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat increased your chance of having a heart attack if you're a female with pre-existing heart disease. That's increased, right? 26%. So... But the results were actually deliberately, and I, I say deliberately because I don't believe that for $700 million, you're not getting very good editorial control. I think you've got some good editors. Well, they might have spent all their money on something else and then... I'm pretty sure they had a few bucks there for a proof. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. You would have been able to say, oh, you know what, guys? The only statistically significant finding of our study actually wasn't mentioned in the conclusion or the abstract or the results section. That, do you think that might be a bit of an oversight? No, yeah, to be fair, they might not have had money for a proofreader. Who knows? But anyway, this, the evidence for this finding, the only statistically significant finding, which basically means the only finding in the whole study, was published in obscure text in one you know, simple sentence that most people would not know what it means when they read it on page 661 of the journal. So when we ask, so going, going back to your original question, why do people not talk about this whole thing about, you know, association with cholesterol and all that? I think there's a de degree of mischievous behaviour from some people who have, uh, who have done research um, with a, a preconceived notion about what they wanted to find. And I think they've made attempts to make sure that any data to the contrary hasn't actually entered the public domain or at least hasn't entered it in a meaningful way where it can contribute to the scientific discourse. And the unfortunate thing about that is that it's not just the public who are affected, you and I. So certainly my medical education was tainted. The nutritional element was certainly tainted with this, um, with this level of deception.
as I'm sure yours was. Yeah, and I think that's a hard thing. I think there was a there's a party line. So if you step outside the party line, you either get blackballed or, or you you uh, get criticized heavily. It's it's a tough. I saw this with John Yudkin, um, you know, the um, with his book, he was uh, of the Ansel Keys era, and he he came out and said, you know what, guys, sugar's a problem, um, and Ansel Keys was obviously this uh, egomaniacal um, individual. <laughs> Um, who didn't have a leg to stand on scientifically, but he was very charismatic and very influential. And uh, we basically saw Yudkin's career um, was demolished. And I don't believe he still has had recognition for some of his amazing insights and contributions to the science. And you look at that, you know, we have people like uh, Dr. Fetke, your countryman, and... and uh, <laughs> Uh, Tim Noakes and you know all these guys who went through that that they could have just backed down and and just walked off into the sunset but they didn't you know they had the courage to to fight it and ultimately mm. were vindicated and I wonder how many people have actually you know gone by the wayside because they just haven't wanted to fight the uh, entrenched establishment and the bias um, and the the consequences that come with that yeah, it's a hard thing because it's your reputation. You know, we all had to step out. I mean, a guy like you steps out. And when I first saw you, I think, wow, this guy knows his stuff. You come out like a young looking kid, athlete. And <laughs> wow, you know, the data you have is very impressive. So I think we have to really reassess what we're thinking, you know, what we're seeing. You know, someone like Dr. Unwin who practiced for 25 years and then reverses his thing you know, and, and uh, Professor Noakes. And so I think there's a lot of people, they've sold their whole reputation on an idea. And when that idea doesn't pan out, they feel like their whole life has been wasted rather than saying, well, let me reverse what I thought before. Maybe I have to change my opinion now. I mean, what, what David's done is just absolutely fantastic. I mean, I have, you know, I, I count him as a friend and I, I spend time with him when I can. And uh, I, I'm just in awe of his lack of ego and, and how humble he can be. So, it's very hard for a lot of people to actually turn around and say, you know what? I was wrong. I'm going to, and then become a cheerleader for the other side. And I think this is something that the public doesn't get with Tim Noakes either. Essentially for him to turn around. I mean, this guy is an A1 rated scientist, highest level in the world. He was incredibly well regarded and effectively it was his writing that got me into this because I'm, uh, you know, I'm into sports. I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician and he is the doyen of, of sports and exercise science and i'm like well if this guy says this then i'm going to look into it you know it's uh um he has a lot of credibility but he turned around and said i was wrong he opened himself up to critical uh you know ridicule and criticism from that and i don't think he gets enough credit people say well you made a mistake therefore you're wrong it's like no he, he evolved with the science he admitted he made a mistake and that's a lot harder and people are using that as a criticism. And I think that people should be really, you know, hailing, hailing him for doing that because what he's done is actually very hard as far as human nature goes. We certainly see Ansel Keys couldn't admit he was wrong. The, the, the authors of the Sydney Diet Heart Study couldn't admit they were wrong. The authors of the Minnesota Coronary Study couldn't admit they were wrong. The investigators in the Women's Health Initiative Study couldn't admit they were wrong. There's far more harm being done by people who are operating on this, uh, they've got their own personal agenda and their pride getting in the way. Somebody like Tim Noakes, you know, we should be holding him up. Yeah, and I think we are now. We had him on episode 100, and that was a huge honor for us to have him because of, you know, the, the contributions he's made, you know, and just a very nice, caring person and, and bright, you know, and someone like you who comes up and bright young guy bringing up the, you know, bringing these things to the forefront and being having the courage to step up and go, they're wrong, and here's the data. And when you have data to support you, you know, and, and like what Dr. Um, all of them said, but Dr. Noakes in particular said, you know, when you have the truth on your side, you, you lose a lot of fear, you know, there, you, you know well, that I mean, these things are going to come effectively around. Effectively, how I, my view on it, because I'm, I've, I'm good friends with Gary, Gary Fetke, who's been, you know, obviously uh, knocked on the head a little bit, um, uh, very unjustly. And, but I'm, with his experience, it's given me a lot of confidence. And I'm also, anything that I say, I can point to peer-reviewed scientific literature. I try not to step outside the bounds. And if I do sort of make anything that's a, uh, I, I come up with any assumptions, then I'll always point to the source of how I, I came to those assumptions. So I actually feel like I'm on pretty solid ground because we have so much science supporting us. I feel I'm on stable ground here. And you know, as you and I both think it's unfathomable why other people 
you can't look at the same evidence and come to the same conclusion. Well, and clinical experience plays a role too. When you say, hey, you know, all the theory says this and it's not working, you know, we, a lot of us had to reassess, like Dr. Unwin. You know, a lot of us had to look and say, gosh, we're going to ruffle feathers, but this isn't working. Obviously, look around and we want to blame it on video games or whatever it is that, that everyone's getting obese and diabetic. And I think, again, going back, this COVID brought all this to the forefront to say, who's dying and who's the sickest? And then, yeah. you know, I, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about quickly was, uh, you know, with, with um, uh, Ivor, you were talking about fasting, you know, talking about well, fasting this time. And that's interesting, kind of an interesting thing. One thing you guys didn't get to, but I, I want to hear your, your take on that. Well, let's have a think about, you know, what's the best way of correcting insulin resistance? Fasting. I mean, <laughs> without a shadow of doubt. So or cutting out carbohydrates, right? Clearly the immune system you know, will benefit from certain proteins, certain amino acids on and so forth, and it's energy requiring and all of this. But, and so you'd say instinctively, you might think, well, you know, is fasting going to be such a good idea? It's probably uh, not going to, you know, it's going to cause some harms. But um, the simple fact is we have evidence that fasting in um, two week fasting too. So, you know, water for 14 days actually enhances the, uh, some of the immune responses. So we have something called natural killer cell activity. So we found that on average, there was an, uh, um, the, the, the unit of measurement of this, uh, the function of natural killer cells in the control group was 41. And that increased by 10 points after a two week fast. We have these uh, antibodies that uh, basic, and it's, Antibodies come in different flavors. They come in, uh, you know, what we call IgG, IgA, and IgM. And they measured all three types of these antibodies. And they found that all of them had significant increases after a two-week fast. And, well, let's go back to Ansel Keys. So he did his famous, uh, famous study, and it was published in a, a book called The Biology of Human Starvation. And they basically starved these conscientious objectors over 24 weeks. They gave them severely calorie-restricted diet, which would be predicted to suppress their immune system. And so they were actually meticulously monitoring them for things like uh, upper respiratory tract infections, so on and so forth. They didn't see any increase in these infections at all across basically six months of uh, significant caloric restriction. So it's, um, and then if we go back to some of the other data, we go back to uh, a couple, John and Anne Murray, and they've got publications uh, in The Lancet from the 1970s. And they were actually dealing with the African famines. And they would have uh, a lot of these, um, these starved individuals come in. And they made the observation that a lot of them had latent infections, which is basically meaning an infection that's is that the immune system has got under control. It's not completely eradicated, but it's not causing any harm. It's being walled off by the immune system. And they observed that when they fed them grains, so when they, because they weren't giving them protein and fat and everything, they, the food shortage. So they fed them grains, high carbohydrate refeeding, these latent infections would frequently um, take off, that they would become out of control. And they actually didn't, they, they actually had a problem because they had starving people come in, they wanted to feed them, and they were seeing that these guys were having out-of-control infections if they were feeding them. So there's something about this, uh, this carbohydrates um, that can potentially be deleterious for um, uh, infection as well, and it could be that just that these grains were worsening the insulin resistance. And, you know, we, we do have some studies um, in uh, ICUs as well, so we know that if, we, uh, if people are so sick that they can't eat normally, um, it, and this is a study they did on ventilated patients, so it wasn't tube ventilation, so they didn't have the tube down their throat, they just had like a mask on or giving some oxygen. Then they actually looked at the data and they said, well, what happens if they can't eat normally? We can either not feed them for a couple of days or we can give them artificial feeding which, where we stick a tube through their nose or something like that and squirt some uh, food into them. And they actually found that the guys who didn't eat actually did better than the guys who were artificially fed. Now, not all the data points in this direction. So there has been uh, some study, one study, um, when I say some, that one, 
that showed that there may have, when they put females on a severely calorie restricted diet and they lost a, a bunch of weight, that their immune response seemed to be attenuated. But when I went and had a look at this study, it was calorie restricted, but it was sure as heck high carb as well. So it was probably similar to what some of these Africans were being fed, basically high carbs. So I certainly think there's a differential effect. And if we are, I don't necessarily think that you need to fast to boost the immune system. Um, but I certainly think if you're going to be eating, it's probably good to be eating things that isn't going to be causing a big uh, insulin release and uh, contributing to insulin resistance. Well, you know, the other inter interesting thing since we're down this rabbit hole is when you're fasting, your LDL goes up generally. It I does. see it, 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 it goes up significantly with, with the three-day fast. Dave Feldman has shown that with his Feldman protocol, and a lot of us have seen that through fasting, LDL goes up. And if that has some kind of a role in the immune system, that may be a partial explanation for some of this too as an antioxidant or something along those lines. Oh, yeah. And um, so we've got rat, uh, rat studies where they actually uh, infect them with some you know, pretty bad infections, and then they injected them with human LDL right? Human LDL. And they found that that could actually um, significantly increase the survival of these, these rodents from infections. So, and I mean, look, your observation, uh, just to make a, a quick point, is that I have a lot of patients come in and say, oh, my LDL is too high. And it's like, how long did you fast for? And a lot of people say, oh, 18 hours or 20 hours. And it's like, well, just, you know, fast for the minimum period of required time and you'll see your LDL will be much lower. Yeah, um, and, and so there's so, so much. We're learning so much along those lines. And, and, and I'll tell you the other observation that's interesting that we've noticed in, in, you know, in the ICUs and when people stop eating, um, sometimes they have this moment of clarity. They could be completely out of it. And it may be ketosis, maybe something else, but they'll wake up and say, hey, you know, make sure you pay the bills. Make sure this is taken care of. They have this moment of clarity even right before they die. And Jason Fung and I have talked about that. And he said, you know, Brian, this, it could be a, a last-ditch effort to really boost the immune system and do whatever you can because when you get really sick, you stop eating. That's your first, in no one says, oh, I want pizza when they're really sick. You know, they, 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 those, those food cravings and all that goes away and your natural tendency is not to eat. Yeah, and look, I, I still think though, I mean, if we have a look at the, uh, the what we call the enteral feeds where you, you basically get a, a goop of sugar and vegetable oil, um, well, they're the commercial formulas anyway and feed it to people. Um, we've got very good evidence that feeding people low carbohydrate formulas and low polyunsaturated fat formulas actually significantly uh, improves your health. It, so in certain populations where the studies have actually been done in neonates, it improves their survival, it improves their liver function. Uh, there's a study that was done uh, in 1989 that actually showed you could get people off a ventilator 62 hours earlier. You know, I saw um, that study. Absolutely. Yeah, that's stunning. So and so and the criteria. So basically, they the, the, the subjects had to meet certain criteria before they could be taken off the ventilator. They had to have certain oxygen levels met and certain things like this. Um, and even though they were coming off the ventilators earlier, these patients were still they had much less carbon dioxide levels and there was a trend for um, less oxygen need. Um, before they were coming off the ventilators just because they're on low carb formulas. So I certainly think that sure fasting is, uh, you know, maybe a way of, of getting a kick in the immune system, but probably only if you're insulin resistant, I would still probably think, I mean, the, the immune system is very energy demanding and, uh, and it does benefit. We, we've got very good evidence that particular amino acids um, will support the function of the immune system. So my, my absolute recommendation would be that, you know, if you were going to, I'd probably keep eating when you're, when you're sick. And when you're febrile, your, your basal metabolic rate goes up through the roof. You need energy. But just make sure it's not, not something that's going to be damaging you. It's not a carbohydrate-rich diet that's going to be spiking your blood sugars. It's going to be causing massive insulin releases. It's going to be worsening insulin resistance. You don't have these oxidizable oil, vegetable and seed oils in there that's going to be damaging the liver and contributing to the insulin resistance. Just eat healthy. Well, and that may be a big change coming. Don't you see that as a as a change coming with the the um, the tube feeds and and uh, uh, that that they're going to start using healthier fats in that? Well, they already Changing are. The so, seed oils, yeah. So, but but and uh, but they're going to a halfway house. So, and when I say a halfway house, they're going away from the polyunsaturated oils, which have got multiple bonds that are prone to oxidation, to monounsaturated oils, which have got a single bond prone to oxidation. So clearly, a single bond prone to oxidation is better 
than multiple bonds. But why not just go to a saturated fat which doesn't have any of these bonds prone to oxidation? Because it's a hard being a salesman to say, okay, we're going to give you a saturated fat in your veins. <laughs> and that's that woman's been fearful of her 50 years. Olive oil has got this mythical myth about it that it's particularly healthy. And there's no doubt that it's healthier because it's less oxidation prone than these things with double, double bonds on their carbon chains. But I think it is, you know, we can't pretend for a second that the olive oil we're ingesting isn't contributing to oxidation stress. And we know, so when, we, when our fats get absorbed, they get absorbed into things called chylomicrons. We can actually measure oxidation in chylomicrons. And the more oils you have in a meal, the more oxidation we measure. And we can also see that these oxidation products get delivered to the liver where they actually do damage. We've got a, you know, electron microscopy in animal studies where we can actually literally see the, the oxidizing of the liver and the, the fatty liver that results from ingesting oxidized fats. And we know this for, it's not a matter of Will your liver be damaged if you have a, a standard feed with oxidized oils in hospital, these enteral feeds? The question is how badly your liver will be damaged and how quickly will it be damaged? Um, this is, and we know that, you know, we do things to reduce the oxidation potential. We add antioxidants. You can often see, I don't know if you've seen it before, these bags wrapped in black plastic or silver foil to reduce the light going in because they're so oxidation prone, they can't even be exposed to bloody daylight. So, yeah. If it's that unstable, why give it? Well, and then you look at it from that same standpoint, someone who has an acute stroke with inflammation of the brain, right? And they're giving them IV sugar to increase oh, the inflammation. It, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's bizarre. I mean, as you know, there's a lot, been a lot of debate for a long time over whether your, your sugar levels should be kept high or kept low after a stroke. But my perspective on it is um, fluctuations, whatever you do, it's the fluctuations which are causing the damage. And if we're, I've seen cases where people on feeds have actually stopped having their blood sugar levels tested because it was too anxiety provoking because it was impossible to keep the sugar levels stable. What kind of a response is that? Oh, um, you know, we're worried about your mental health. Yeah, your blood sugars, they're sort of like 15, 16, 18. We're just going to stop testing. Yeah. Seriously. Stop looking. Yeah, stop looking because you stress me out. Well, Matt, so what, what, is your, what is your formula right now for people listening that are worried about COVID or being infected? What do you say, okay, here's the things you, you have control of that you can do to minimize your risk right now? Exercise. Yeah, I mean, this is a no-brainer. We haven't talked about that at all today, but it absolutely has to be any conversation we have about insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity. You have to do exercise, and it can't be this kind of, you know, weak ask. you know, I'm just going for a stroll around the block. You have to, you know, obviously, and a caveat, if you're unhealthy, be cleared by a doctor first. And I, I'm not your doctor. Yeah, no medical advice here. Yep, that, that's our caveat for the day. But exercise, and it, 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 the, it has to have a degree of intensity. And this whole business of the intense exercise suppresses the immune system and all that. Sure, don't go and run a marathon, but don't be afraid to get a sweat either. And don't neglect resistance exercise. Get some muscle because the, the muscle tissue has actually what we call a GLUT4 transporter that actually when you contract a muscle, that GLUT4 transporter that takes sugar out of your circulation is active even without insulin. It is insulin independent. So it doesn't matter how insulin resistant you are, contracting your muscles against resistance is going to be a damn good thing. And then we have sun exposure, safe sun exposure. That means you're not getting sunburn. That means you're having a, a heavy UVA dose and you're making sure that you restrict the UVB dose. You'll get enough UVB anyway. Don't worry about that. So, I mean, basically, if you get your vitamin D level up to over 30 or more, then that's probably okay. And the reason that higher levels of vitamin D are then being associated with better health is likely due to the association with nitric oxide. And then diet. Don't have any liquid fats. That includes olive oil because it's prone to oxidation. Your fat should be solid at room temperature. If it's solid at room temperature, the reason it's solid is because it lacks these double bonds that are prone to oxidation. So the liquidity of a fat is all pretty well proportional to the level, how much it's prone to oxidation. That's a pretty good clue. And then control your blood sugars. 
understand that glucose is a sugar. Carbohydrates are quite literally a chain of glucose molecules. It is sugar waiting to enter your bloodstream and give you a spike in blood sugar and waiting to cause your body to release insulin and to contribute to insulin resistance. And then other sugars like fructose are even worse. So control your blood sugars, have healthy fats, exercise, healthy lifestyle, and the last one is sleep. We, we, we can, this is too easy to pass over. So, you know, for so long, people have gone to their doctors, I'm tired, doctor, are you sleeping well? Oh, you should sleep more. But it's really just dealt with on the periphery and it's not given the respect it really needs. They did a study. So they got this virus and they squirted it up people's nose, right? And they had people who were having less than seven hours sleep a night which a lot of people do, and people who had more than eight hours sleep a night. So the difference between seven and eight hours sleep, not a great deal, right? And they found that the people who were less than seven hours sleep a night were three times more likely to develop a symptomatic infection. Three times. This is absolutely huge. And we also know that sleep deprivation is associated with insulin resistance. It all comes back to the same pathway. So you would have heard of the dawn phenomenon. So this is actually directly associated with sleep deprivation because it is an, a market of insulin resistance. So you have this natural cortisol release in the morning, but if you're so insulin resistant, your body can't actually handle, um, deal with that, uh, the, the effect of that cortisol release. And we see that when people become sleep deprived, their morning, their, their waking blood glucose levels are much, much higher. When they get enough sleep, we actually see a big drop. So please do not underestimate sleep. It improves insulin sensitivity and it absolutely improves your resilience to viral infection. They're the big ones. Yeah, and that's and, and you know the only one I would add is stress. You know, because stress affects sleep and sleep affects stress levels and all that, and that's bumping cortisol and insulin resistance and all that. Man, that is awesome. Anyone listening, that is the key. Take that home. You know, obviously social distancing and staying away from sick people and all that kind of stuff. But you know, these are things that you can do instead of sitting at home and eating cookies all day to calm your nerves is saying, hey, let me get on workout. Let me do something constructive. Let me calm my nerves somehow. Let me help someone else in the community and you know, do their shopping for them or whatever you have to do. These are all very, very positive things. And, and this is how we survive these kind of things because this isn't the last time this is happening. So we have to prepare. You know, everyone's looking for an immunization. That's not going to happen in a month. Trust me on that. You know, I mean, our immunizations, I mean, I think the shortest one we have so far is four years, right? So they're saying, well, 18 months. Yeah, wishful thinking. But, uh, you know, all these things are what you have in your wheelhouse to do. So, Doc, thank you. Any other parting words of wisdom? It, it I really enjoyed this hour. I've learned a lot, really, just hearing all the studies that you have and all that. I'm, I want to write down notes and, and look all this stuff up because it's it's remarkable. You know, obviously, you're doing your homework and you're kind of a geek and spend a lot of time, time looking at all those studies. But it's important. It's, you know, knowing the research and knowing the data is really critical. So having guys like you out there on the front lines is really helping patients. You know, and I know you're having a lot of clinical success. I hear your stories of what you're doing. And very remarkable. Very remarkable. We need you to move to San Diego. Well, we were planning. There, there was a conference scheduled. Where I was actually uh, hoping to, uh, you know, chew the fat with you there and uh, catch up over a few meals. But uh, it remains to be seen whether that's... Uh, that's yeah, we'll see, man. We'll see. We'll have to play it by ear. But, you know, having a bunch of metabolically healthy people together is a pretty good deal if we're trying to fight this thing together. But hopefully it's all done. Hopefully this is all done by August that we can kind of move around a little bit. So I'll probably, I bet they're probably going to delay it till before the next flu season, which is short. And, you know, it makes sense. I always think, why do we have big football games and conferences and all this stuff during the flu season every year? You know, maybe we learn something out of this deal. So let's do it in the middle of the summer. So whatever. So doc, if people want to get in touch with you, how do they consult you or how do they get in touch with you? What's the best way? Well, probably the easiest thing to do is just to go to my uh, Twitter handle, which is Dr. Paul Mason. Um, I'm at Twitter there and I've actually got a, uh, a link there in my profile that takes you to an online booking form. So I'm doing uh, video conferencing now um, for nutritional consultations. So uh, I'm, uh, yeah, very happy to uh, consult with people from around the world. Wow, that's great. You could do it all around the world, huh? So yeah, the wonders of the interwebs, huh? Yeah, so, that's great. That's awesome. So, so many people contact us and want help and you know your stuff on this. So, hey, all of our listeners, if you want to have a good source of, of great uh, information and uh, uh, get your health back on track, give Doc a call.
thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for, for your education and, and for all you're doing down there. And, and one of these days, I'm going to make it down to Australia. It's gonna Matt, we'd love to have you down here. It would be awesome. All right. Hey, everyone, thank you so much for your support, for keeping us going. We're hearing great stories. And, and uh, thank you so much for the, all the iTunes uh, props and, and uh, reviews. We greatly appreciate that. And, and for the support on Patreon, you know, we really, really appreciate it. You've uh, helped us just to not have to um, take outside funding and to keep us going. So, Tro, what do you have to say, man? Thank you for listening to the Low Carb MD podcast. We really appreciate every single positive feedback, all the comments, all our listeners, everybody on Patreon who supported us. You guys have kept us commercial free without bias, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you. And if you haven't had time yet, please take a minute and just uh, click a, a review and um, Again, uh, share this with your friends and family. We appreciate it. And we're over a million downloads, believe it or not, Tro. This is super awesome. So thank you all for listening. You are greatly appreciated.